Hi, I'm Justin. Uh, today's going to be kind of cool. I'm going to go through the Sangre de Cristo range traverse route and we're going to do a little survey on it. I'm going to fire up Cal Topo and we're going to check out some of the main characteristics of it, peaks that you hit, stages of the route, what to expect when it comes to water, camping, terrain, and then we're going to compare uh, Sangre de Cristo range traverse to other long distance mountain challenges and see how it stacks up. Join me! Okay, so to begin, let's just check out the range itself and see how it fits into the, the big picture of mountains of Colorado. So on my screen right now, I'm in Cal Topo, and in the center of the screen is the Sangre de Cristo range. It's this range, I'm going to use my mouse, that goes north, generally southeast, and ends around here. Uh, the Sangre de Cristo mountains continue south into New Mexico. It's this long spine of mountains there. For this talk, I am just going to be interested in this part right here, which is um, called the Sangre de Cristo range. And it's very unique and interesting. As the crow flies, it's about 75 miles. And as you see, can see, I'll zoom in a little bit, there aren't so many foothills from the San Luis Valley on the west and the kind of Arkansas headwaters to the east. Um, it just rises up from the basin to form this center ridge line you can see right here. And that's pretty amazing. Other mountain ranges that do that are like the Grand Tetons. So it's kind of unique in that, that way, especially for mountains in Colorado. If we go a little bit to the Northwest, we'll get into the Sawatch. And you can see the Sawatch more like, there is kind of a central range, but there are mountains like just everywhere. And there's also foothills and smaller and larger mountains. Not quite so much for the Sangres. Okay, so that's generally the Sangre de Cristo range. I'm going to open up some layers in Cal Topo, and we're just going to take a survey of, of that part. I'll share the link to this Cal Topo map so you can just check it out and play around yourself at your leisure. So let's put the actual line of the route up. Boom. So there it is. On the top, the north side, it starts in Salida, and then on the south here, it ends at the beginning of Lake Como Road and where it hits the highway, where it hits pavement for the first time in that 122 miles that makes up the, the, um, the route itself. It's pretty, pretty spectacular. I'm gonna click on the line itself and we're just gonna look at the profile. Okay, so as you can see from the elevation profile, the route starts from the, the base of the valley and just climbs precipitously up until you're almost at like 12,000 feet and then just kind of stays there going up and down all these little peaks for the majority of the route <laughs> until we get right about here, which is one of the, the big passes. I believe that's Mosca Pass. Um, and then just kind of continues over until the last couple peaks over here. So it's very unrelenting. In total, there are about 60 names peaks on this route. So let's check those out. I'm going to go on the left hand and just turn on the peaks layer. Okay, well there they all are. So if we zoom in, you can see that this whole range is just chock full of peaks on that main ridge line. It's pretty incredible. Um, like I said, there's around 55,000 feet of elevation gain in total in this route, which makes, it's one of the reasons why this route is so difficult. Another reason why this route is so difficult is there, there aren't any trails really to speak of um, that connect all these peaks. All you're really doing is following the ridge line. So sometimes the ridge line is very broad and grassy. Other times it's like a class two talus hop. Sometimes it's technical scrambling, class three, four, five. It generally depends on where you are in the route. It's it, it's sensational though. It's, it's quite a place to be because once you're on the ridge line, you can look to the east and the west and you just see this incredible drop off. And it's an amazing position to be in. And to be in that position for days, 
for sure. Which is one of the reasons why it's I'm so drawn to it. Okay, so when we talk about these peaks, generally you're gonna find uh, the summits around 12,000 to 14,000 feet tall, which is kind of incredible. There are five named 14ers on the route, and two of the four great traverses are part of the route too. So it's, it's as routes go, this is pretty extreme. Um, this is definitely not your normal everyday 100 miler. It's one of the reasons why it ha just hasn't been done all that much. There's still just a handful of people who have completed it. And of those handful of people, I think maybe three have done it unsupported. So bringing all their gear from start to the finish. And one of them is me. So there's only two other people who have done it. What else can I say? <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about water on the, the route. Uh, most of the water you're going to find is going to be locked up in fields of snow, uh, which you'll have to melt in some way. There aren't any real lakes on the route. There's very few creeks when you drop down into some of the passes and very few springs. So what you must do, unless you want to drop off the ridge, is melt snow. In my 2019 trip, I took a stove to make melting snow a lot easier. On subsequent attempts, I just tried to melt it, which has its own pitfalls because, you know, that snow isn't always available as water when you want it to be. Okay, camping. Because it's a ridge line, there's not a lot of great camp spots, again, unless you want to drop off the ridge. And I, and I keep saying that, like, if you want to drop off the ridge, because dropping off the ridge just means you, there's more descending and more climbing. And for a route like this where there's so much climbing and descending already, you kind of want to keep that to a minimum. But because again, it's a ridge line, there's not a lot of flat parts, there's not a lot of great camping areas. Most of the camping spots are going to be very exposed to the elements. And you know, like the, the ground just isn't going to be very flat. You're basically camping on rocks, things like that. So in Caltopo, I'm going to turn on another layer that shows just flat ground camping. And we're just going to tour the route a little bit and look for those flat grounds. So I'm at the northern side and we're just going to look. There might be a little bit right there on the summit of a peak. Great. <laughs> Not great. So as you can see, as we follow the line, there just isn't a lot of opportunity for flat ground to camp. There might be a little nook right there at Bushnell Peak. It doesn't really get into good camping until you get to one of the passes, really hidden pass, where there's legitimate camping like underneath a tree that's fairly well protected and you could probably even find a water source nearby. So that's one of the big problems is camping is really hard to do. So at the best of times, you're going to be bivvying it and it's, it's not going to be a five-star campsite. So like I said, like the elevation gain of this route is pretty extreme with there being 55,000 feet of climbing only for the 120 miles that you're on it. I do have another layer that shows mileage on the route. I'll turn that on. And also turn on a layer that shows how much elevation gain you get going north to south. And something really curious happens, you'll notice that almost for the entire part of the route, for every 10 miles you travel, you gain 5,000 feet of elevation gain. And this is fairly constant um, for the majority of the route. So we have gone 20 miles and we have gone 10,000 feet of elevation gain by the time we hit Red Mountain. And as you see, it just kind of continues. It's pretty incredible. What this generally means is there's no real rest for climbing. Once you get on the ridge, or actually once you start at mile zero, you will be climbing an average of 5,000 feet per 10 miles. Okay, so we've established that this is a very challenging route. How do you conceptualize this? How do you break this down to make it easy to understand? So what I've done is I've created basically kind of sections, segments, stages, whatever you want to use, of the route to kind of give you a brief idea of what you can expect in every part of this route. So I'm gonna turn on that layer. I've cut up the range into six different sections and then rated them on difficulty. So let's give a little uh, little tour and we'll, we'll hit up some of the highlights. This first stage is starting in Salida. 
and going up the Methodist Mountain starting on the ridge line itself. The first 10 miles, easy road walking until you hit Methodist Mountain and then you establish yourself on that ridge line which you will not like leave for another 110 miles. It's it's actually pretty incredible. Terrain kind of varies. It's it's somewhat in the trees for a while, and then you hit tree line. There used to be a lot of blowdown, but there's been recent recent ish fires that have cleared that all away. So it's pretty pretty easy going. You do get out of the trees for a little bit and get a taste of what the rest of the route's going to be like, which is a lot of off trail class two talus hopping and i've ended this stage at uh, hidden pass and this first pass hidden pass is a really good goal to make for the first day just because it's great camping you're below tree line you're protected it's a lower elevation so sleep is going to be a lot better okay stage two is uh starts at hidden pass where we left off on stage one and ends at basically the first 13,000 foot mountain that you come across named cottonwood peak i've rated this easy green it starts on a trail although it's it's a very ill-defined trail and weaves through through a few forests until you again establish yourself right on the ridge line um, and get out of tree line. The mountains here are, they can be talisy, but they can also be covered in tundra. It's generally pretty easy going. It's, it's a shorter section, but um, it's nice reprieve, if anything, from the first section to Hidden Pass. Okay, stage three, which I've called the thick of it. Once you're on 13,000 foot Cottonwood Peak, you will be at or above 12,000 feet until you get to essentially Music Pass, which is many, many miles away. I wanna say 30, but it might be a little bit more than that. This means that th this is kind of like the hardest place to camp or rest. There is no cover. You're gonna be camping on the ridge line, no matter what you do, unless you really wanna drop down, which is time consuming and effort, lots of effort to do so. And as you see, there's just so many peaks to hit. So I've labeled this uh, orange as being pretty hard just because of how long it is, how many peaks you hit, how high it is, how hard it is to bail. Um, as you see, these 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 ridge lines that go generally, you know, southwest and northeast, like they don't go to a town, they don't really go to a trailhead. So once you're down on the valley floor, you still gotta get to the highway, <laughs> which is like five or 10 more miles. So you really are committed here. So we end uh, stage three at Fluted Peak. And Fluted Peak is basically the start of where things get really technical for a really long time. And we start stage four, which I've I've named the Crestone Crux. And this is probably like what you came for. This is some incredible, incredible terrain. Starting from Fluted Peak, it's like a class three bop to Mount Adams. There's a crumbling ridge line to Obstruction Peak, which defies logic. It, I don't know why it's still there. Like the Crestone conglomerate that makes up these mountains is usually really good. Not so between Mount Adams and Obstruction Peak. And then what you have is Crestone Peak, which is probably the crux of the whole thing. I've decided to take the North Buttress route, which has some very, very um, sensational positions to get to Northeast Crestone, East Crestone, and then Crestone Peak. And then once you're done with that, you have to do the Crestone Traverse to Crestone Needle, which is no slouch. And then you have to get off of Crestone Needle safely. and. Before you know it, you have to do Broken Hand Peak, which isn't done all the time because there's all these sensational mountains around it. And then you have to do this catwalk all the way to the summit of Marble Mountain. And that is what makes up the Crestone Crux. You'll be doing 11 miles of class three. <laughs> class three scrambling if that's to believe but if you can get through it if you can get through it in a day you can you can probably finish the rest of the route so just keep on it there's a few places you could bivy in an emergency on my 2019 trip i actually bivied on the top of cresto needle just to do it that made you know descending the the crux pitch of the cresto needle or the cresto traverse a little interesting without coffee and being early in the morning but got it done uh memory will stay with me forever though the next stage i have labeled the zewichin sai and as you see it's one of the longer stages and it has a unique um it has a very unique uh, characteristic where if you look at the crestone crux in red 
see how many peaks there are, and then you look at the Zwichen Psi, not as many, even though the, the length of this stage is much more. So why is that? Well, this is a low point of the ridgeline itself. There's um, two named passes, Madano and Mosca Pass. If you needed to, you could probably drive a car across them. But what's cool is you do hit those two passes, Madano and Mosca, which make you know great camping nearby. There's a creek at the northern pass. You can camel up. And what's really funny about this section is Mount Zerwichin reigns supreme, and it's only at a lowly 12,000 feet, and on paper it looks like it should be a walk in the park, and it's anything but. It's all under tree line. It's really crazy bushwhacking. Um, I was in Blowdown that was also in an aspirin grove in 2019 in disbelief going, what am I doing with my life? The bug pressure is going to be really hard this time of year. So there's going to be mosquitoes everywhere. Long story short, it's not something you should discount this, this stage. And the stage ends basically on the summit of California Peak from the southernmost pass. I think it's Mosca. It's, it's kind of a nice tundra walk to California Peak and then you start in on it on the last tiny section which I've labeled Queen Bear for the Queen stage. And this is the section that starts again at California Peak which is a centennial, one of the highest 100 peaks in Colorado. And you will then go over Ellingwood Point, 14er, uh, Blanca Peak, another 14er, and do the traverse to Little Bear in the, the opposite direction of what you usually do to Little Bear. So that's pretty sensational. That's another sensational part of this route and why it's so incredible and unique. And once you sit on top of Little Bear, you're basically done. My route takes you um, down the southwest ridge of Little Bear, where you will, if you will believe me, lose 6,400 feet of elevation in just a few miles to get down back into the San Luis Valley and touch that trailhead sign for Lake Coma Road and hit the pavement to, you know, thumb yourself back to civilization in uh, Alamosa if you can. So again, it's a very short segment, but it will take a lot of time because the, the scrambling is not to be trifled with. The north ridge of Ellingwood Peak has one of the cruxiest parts. The Little Bear Blanca Traverse, again, is one of the four great 14er traverses. Okay, so that's the overview of the route. It's just pretty incredible. I'll be trying to do this in around five days, which is, I think, pretty fast. It's gonna be about a day and a half faster than I did the last time in 2019. Um, how I think I'm going to do that is just by bringing far less gear and perhaps being in a little bit better shape and having a little bit more experience on the route. Let's see if my theory holds up that that's gonna make a big difference. Okay, so I've made myself a little smaller, and I thought it'd be interesting to compare this route to other routes in Colorado, other FKTs, other races, and try to get a feel of like, why, why is it so difficult? Okay, so on the top of my screen, I have a couple stats about the route, and at the bottom I have the, the elevation profile. So mileage, the route's about 122 miles, 55,000 feet of elevation gain. And that works for to about 450 feet you have to climb every mile. Um, that also means you have to basically descend 450 feet every mile, which gives you um, an idea what you know what it's like to trudge up and down these peaks, since each peak is two miles apart from each other on average. The FKT for this going south to north is about 107 hours, which I think is blazingly fast, four days and change. I can't find a successful um, trip that goes north to south. I've failed twice. I just don't know if anyone's been interested in going fast and light north to south. Okay, the train, the easiest train of this is, uh, there's some pavement at the very beginning. Coming out of Salida, you're on like a pavement, paved road for like a mile. That quickly turns into a dirt road, and once you're on Methodist Mountain, you're going to get 
class two talus hopping for the most part. The hardest terrain is uh, those class, those easy fifth sections. So we're talking about basically the entire Crestone Crux and the Blanca Little Bear Traverse. There's just no trails on this route. There's just no reason to think there'd be a trail. You'll hit trail segments, but man, the Sangries, even if it says there's a trail, like like on the map, like they might not exist or they've just been destroyed by blowdown or a forest fire or something. As mountain ranges go, in Colorado it's pretty pretty wild all right so let's start comparing this to other races and stuff first one we're gonna we'll compare this to is uh, the Leadville 100 why not the Leadville 100 is about 100 miles uh, 15,000 feet of elevation so 40,000 feet less which works to 150 feet you have to you know climb each mile which is pretty substantial the FKT for the you know the level 100 is 16 hours by you know Matt Carpenter back in the day that, that's fast that is really fast that's running of course you know less than like a 930 pace the FKT for the song race traverse is a little faster than a, a mile an hour <laughs> so uh, so you're going nine times slower is basically what I'm saying. You're going nine times slower. Lots of pavement in Leadville 100. You start in town and it takes you a couple miles just to get to Turquoise Lake. Mostly class one trail, you know, really well maintained class one trail. Colorado Trail, lots of two track. It's enjoyable. It's an enjoyable trail, right? And uh, the max is class one trail, right? It's a running race. You know, I'm not, let's be honest. It's it's a different beast altogether and that's, that's perfectly fine. If you look at the elevation profile, you can notice that there's just way fewer climbs in general. And the two big climbs up and down Hope Pass which make those like reverse vamp upside down vampire um, things that's hope pass and by and large you're much lower in elevation for the you know the entire race than you are in the song grease so two completely different beasts apples and oranges okay let's uh, compare something else okay this is hard rock 100 and now it looks like we got a little bit more elevation prof elevation gain loss so that's cool just looking briefly at the elevation profiles hard rock again is around 100 miles there's 33,000 feet of elevation gain and that works out to about 330 feet a mile which is pretty again pretty substantial FKT for that is 22 hours which again like holy cow like half a day, like less than a day to complete that course is is just incredible that's world class terrain i mean there is some pavement you know getting in out of your and what have you max is a few class two talus hopping i'm sure to get up and down the 14er in the route there is one 14er on the route which is really kind of cool what it's mostly is is class one trail again very well maintained trail so again there's just this disparity in how fast people are doing hard rock compared to this this the San Grid de Cristo range traverse. Okay, Nolan's 14, just on the other side of the San Luis Valley and a little bit north. Nolan's 14 is getting a little bit closer to what this challenge is like. You do go to up 14,000 feet 14 times for 14 14ers, obviously. Nolan's 14 is a little shorter at 88 miles, depending on you know your exact route. But it does have, there's more climbing per mile at 500 feet compared to 450 feet. So in that case, Nolan's 14 is harder. There's just, it's steeper, basically. FKT for that is 41 hours. That's awesome. Like that's incredible. That's a that's an amazing time and I believe that's the unsupported time which makes it all the more incredible. There is some pavement on Nolan's 14. Having reconned Nolan's 14 and tried Nolan's 14 like freaking four times. It's kind of funny how much how chill the terrain can be. There are some off-trail bushwhacking parts but you are just linking up well-used maintained class 1 trails and you know getting on the Colorado Trail and there is some pavement like going to if you're going south to north going to Mount Yale, you're like on a on a highway. Kind of takes you out of it, honestly. But it's mostly oh, I put it as mostly class two talus hopping. So yeah, there might be some class three on Princeton if you squint. There must be a reason why people are going so much faster, three times faster. Okay, I put this one in. This is kind of cool. This is the complete Mosquito 10 mile traverse. And as far as I know, I've I'm the only one that's done it, which is really strange. Most people start, I started at Trout Creek Pass near Buena Vista and went to Frisco. Um, most people start at a pass like, I don't know, like 30 miles 
after Trout Creek Pass north. And I always thought that was kind of kind of cheapens the challenge. So I decided to start and complete the entire range. But I added it here because it's an interesting comparison. One, you're basically on a ridge line the entire time. Two, you're always trying to back peaks. Three, and those aren't all 14ers, so it's kind of cool. And if you look at the elevation profile, like in the middle chunk, that's very similar. The Mosquito 10 mile traverse is interesting because you are at 13,000 feet or higher. Oh gosh, for what, like 20 miles, almost 20 miles. So that's hard to find a way to do that anywhere else in the lower 48. You'll have to go to Alaska to try to put something together like that. And that's very similar to um, the Sangre de Cristo range traverse where you're above 12,000 feet for even longer. The complete um, Mosquito 10 mile is much shorter at 72 miles and you uh, gain 27,000 feet of elevation at a rate of 375 feet a mile. So not as steep as the Sangre de Cristos. Minimum there is some trail. So class one trail, max easy fifth, basically for the Fletcher Atlantic Traverse and maybe nothing else, but it's mostly again class two talus hopping. So very similar if you ever do the complete Mosquito 10 mile or the the abridged <laughs> Mosquito 10 mile, if I, I am, I, am, if I may be so bold to calling it that. Sangre de Cristo range traverse is actually well within your grasp. Okay, this one's kind of a fun one just to, just to put it in. This is the Whirl, uh, the Wasash Ultimate um, link up or however it is. I haven't done it, but I, I pulled this from uh, the interwebs. As you can see, it's much shorter and it's much um, lower elevation, but it gives you kind of a good idea of what the first half of the Sangre de Cristo range traverse must be like ending at Hayden Pass. So this is that first stage we were talking about. And saying that, like it is steeper, being only 32 miles, 18,000 feet elevation, you do gain 563 foot per mile. So it's actually much steeper. Again, like the FKT is something stupendous, like 15 hours. That's that's cool. Minimum is going to be class two talus hopping, I think. Max is easy fifth, and there's quite a bit of it. It's mostly class two talus hopping, so no pavement. I don't think there's any trail. It's just too small of an area. And that's pretty cool. So if we put them all together, we kind of get some ideas. I'm like which metric is harder per, per route. So mileage, the Sangri de Cristo range traverse, it's longer, 122 miles, it makes a difference. You know, that's really gonna be hard to like do in a day, you know, for anyone. No one, not many people can run 122 miles in a day on, you know, like pancake flat racetrack, let alone up and down a mountain range. Elevation gain, because it's so long, it's gonna have the most at 55,000 feet. Gain a mile, like that's the world though. It's just smaller and just action packed, I guess. And then actually Nolan's 14 actually has more feet gain a mile. And then the Sangre de Cristos. So FKT, let's let's get that one for now. Technicality, Sangre de Cristos, um, Mosquito 10 mile traverse, Whirl, all have like easy fit class climbing. The rest not so much, you know, Leadville Hard Rock, those are those are trail runs. Um, Nolan's 14 is sort of like a trail run, but there's off trail sections, we'll call it. And the majority of the ter terrain is either class two off trail for the Songrees, the Mosquito 10 Mile, the Whirl, or class one trail like the Leadville Hard Rock. So why this disparity of the of how fast you can do the Songrees traverse when it comes to another challenge like Nolan's? I've been thinking about this for a while. Um, I'm not the fastest person in the world, and we're not even gonna talk about the Mosquito 10 mile traverse time because that's my time as well, and I think it's really slow. If I was to do the t Mosquito 10 mile traverse again, I'm sure I can go much faster too, now that I know what it's like. Honestly, I think the Sangris traverse is so slow just because one, not a lot of people have done it. When it comes to speed or going fast, I think there's less than 10 people who have tried it with the intent of setting an FKT or fast time. Of those people, it's either been unsupported, so you have to bring five days of food from the start, or it's been kind of self-supported where people leave caches at the major passes, which saves a little bit of weight and helps with um, getting water, but it's not gonna help you with other things like absolute pack weight or something like that. It would be kind of interesting to see someone fully supported do this route. It's just the logistics of it would be very hard to meet up with people at those passes because getting through those passes is not easy. It's so much easier to set up like a table of food and burritos 
add trailhead for Nolan's 14 for your runner just to walk through and then you know cross the highway so I'm not sure if we're ever going to see a, a fully supported Sangre de, de Cristo range traverse saying that I'd really love someone really incredibly fast to take on the Sangre de Cristo range traverse just to see what what they could do I bet they could do under three days that'd be pretty fantastic but I, I just don't know who that'd be the problem is like to get someone that's very fast they also have to have a little bit of technical climbing prowess and fast people usually aren't climbers and vice versa so there might be just a clash of culture going on there but uh, this is an open call for anyone that wants a huge interesting technical challenge and is just looking for something cool to do hopefully i'll be on the route myself in a matter of days it will be my third time trying this stupid thing the first time i got actually blown off the ridge line at 13,000 feet at, in the thick of it um the second time i just kind of like stopped it was october anyways and i just wasn't feeling it there was a little bit too much snow on the ground for my my taste and I just wasn't moving fast enough and I didn't know how I was going to do the Cresto and Traverse with all that snow so I kind of bailed. All right so that's the Sangre de Cristo range traverse route overview. Um, I hope you learned a little bit about the route and what makes it so damn difficult. Um, if you have any more questions please leave them in the comments and I'll leave a link to the Caltobo map itself in the description of this video so you can uh, check that out at your convenience and until next time. Long may you range.